We will get started as soon as the uh, Chief Justice arrives. Okay. Sure there was a, a minute. Minute. Well, legislative review. If I can just introduce the, the folks who are, are here with us. We have Senator Rick Jones, uh, Senator Tanya Shoemaker, uh, Mike Prince, who's the Director of Highway Safety Planning. <laughs> We have <laughs> Chief Marty Underhill from uh, Grand Ledge, uh, uh, Prosecutor Victor Fitz from Cass County. Uh, we have Judge Jonas from uh, Ottawa, correct, Holland, and uh, Judge uh, Susan Dobridge from Cass County. Is that okay? Mike and, and then we have Matt Rajda from. Uh, the Monroe area, I think you were a, a, a graduate of the uh, court of uh, Judge Salamone's court, and Judge uh, Harvey Hoffman uh, from uh, Eaton County, and Judge Gino Salamone from uh, Taylor. And so there's uh, the, the Chief Justice, and we will get started in just a moment. Super. Sorry, I'm late. Chief, we're going to use the other podium, but we have a mic feedback problem. So oh, we're just going to use this as your, as your podium. Yeah. All right. Good. So we're, 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 ready, we're ready to start with you to kick off and uh, get us on the road. To well, good morning. Uh, it's a different perspective down here. Yes, it is. <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us uh, this morning at the uh, Michigan Supreme Court for a historic first ever event. And I welcome everyone who is uh, being able to join us uh, over the internet while uh, streaming. That's one of the more recent innovations we've had in the past year or so. Uh, while we have uh, for several years uh, live streamed the oral argument, this is the first time we've ever used it for uh, live streaming a press conference. In fact, this is probably the only third press conference uh, I've had in 17 years, so the whole thing is a little uh, new to me. What's more uh, exciting is the fact that the courts around Michigan are watching this presentation as well, and then they will continue with their own local press conferences once we have concluded here. Colleagues from the bench who are joining me for the presentation are Cass County uh, 43rd Circuit Judge, uh, Chief Judge uh, 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 Sue Dobert, Wayne County 23rd District Court Chief Judge uh, Joe Grano Salome, Eaton County 56A uh, District Judge uh, Harvey Hoffman. We're also joined by uh, a graduate of Judge Salome's sobriety court, Mr. Uh, Matt Rajda, and uh, watching these proceedings online and holding their own press conferences are Judge Vin uh, Vincent C. Westra, 8th uh, District Court, Kalamazoo, Chief Judge uh, Richard D. Uh, Kuhn, 51st uh, District Court, Waterford, Judge Janine Lavelle, uh, 61st District Court, Grand Rapids, Chief Judge Michael uh, Stepka, uh, 86th District Court, uh, Traverse City, and Assistant Prosecutor, uh, Prosecuting Attorney uh, Griffin, Andrew Griffin for District, uh, for Judge Dennis uh, Gerard, 96th District Court, Marquette. Um, all of these uh, courts contributed to the data in the report we're gonna talk about today. So thank all of you who are participating remotely. I should also note that a working group of representatives from the Secretary of State, Supreme Court, and uh, Association of uh, Treatment Court Professionals 
has been established to facilitate communication among the branches of government and program practitioners. Uh, cooperation uh, fostered by the working group is a perfect example of how we must all work together to keep and to solve important uh, public safety uh, problems. Partners joining us today include Senator Rick Jones, Senator Tanya Schutmaker, uh, Judge Susan uh, Jonas, uh, which 56 District Court Holland, Mike Prince, Director of Highway uh, Safety Planning, Victor Fitz, Cass County Prosecutor and President of uh, P. Uh, Pam, along with uh, Casey Steckelberg uh, of Pam as well. Marty Underhill, Grand Ledge uh, Police Chief and President of the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, Alan Cropsey just came in, uh, uh, Director, Attorney General um, of uh, the uh, Bill Schutte's uh, office. He was the original sponsor of the um, bills that uh, created this very program, so we're glad to have you here. Um, and um, let's see, am I missed anyone? Laura Moody. Laura Moody. Oh, Laura, Laura Moody. I'm sorry. Uh, General's Attorney General's Office. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's always uh, trauma to have a, introduce the VIPs. You're always likely to forget somebody. Did I get everybody? Yep. Good. All right. Uh, now we're here to present the results of an important study regarding the ignition interlock. Uh, and its success in repeating uh, drunk driving offenses. Uh, this is part of a larger um, a set of initiatives that the uh, Supreme Court has undertaken in the last four years to create programs to divert people uh, with problems from expensive imprisonment to find uh, non-incarcerative alternatives that actually address the problems of those people who come before us, uh, whether the problem happens to be mental illness, uh, problems with alcohol, and so on. So that is the, the been the focus of, of the Supreme Court, and this uh, interlock program is a part of the sobriety um, uh, court program. Um, so I want to focus on two points, including concluding. Uh, Michigan's trial judges are not satisfied with doing their jobs uh, the way they've always been done in the past, and they're committed to the kind of reform I just mentioned and to innovations that result in more effective and more efficient courts. And we are, as a part of all of this reform, to, to find better solutions to the problems that, of the people who come before us in uh, the criminal system we are laser-like in focusing on determining whether those programs we've initiated are actually effective. Now, it's kind of a new thing in government. Everybody else in the world actually cares about whether the money they invest is effective. But in Michigan, in the third branch, we want to know whether the programs we are instituting work. And to that end, we have studied all of the programs we've, we reform programs we have introduced uh, to ensure that we're actually getting better outcomes and providing better service to the uh, public. And the report today is, is merely the latest in a series of such reports that show that the, these diversionary programs of our problem solving uh, courts are working. So now I'm honored to turn the podium over to Senator Rick Jones and Senator uh, Tony Soupmaker, both of whom played a critical role in creating and funding this uh, program. Senators? Prior to going to Lansing for 31 years, I served at the Eaton County Sheriff's Office, starting on the road as a deputy, a sergeant, then eventually becoming the jail administrator and eventually the sheriff before I retired from that career. During that time, I saw a lot of recidivism. I saw constantly the same men and women coming back to jail. I was approached late in my career by Judge Harvey Hoffman, and he said, let's start a drug and alcohol court. Let's divert people into programming. Let's not clog up the jails if we don't have to. It's been highly successful. 
and I was happy to be an early supporter of that. Then we got the ignition interlock. That has helped many people return to work, return to college so they can get work. It's been highly successful, happy to play a part in it. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. I think there's nothing more fulfilling in a legislator's career than when you uh, give birth to legislation that really changes people's lives. And I think that that's what this legislation is all about. So Senator Cropsey, a job well done for, for uh, sponsoring this legislation was done. And for all of you uh, behind me, uh, for the job well done that in the part of you've had in terms of changing people's lives for the better. Uh, we're uh, approaching budget season, so certainly as the Chief Justice noted, it's certainly a great opportunity when we can uh, help people with their issues and their problems at a much lower cost of uh, performing the functions of government. So uh, wonderful statistics, so thank you all for being a part of, uh, I think, really changing people's lives. So thanks. Thank you, Senators. And now we'll hear from the president of the Michigan Association of Treatment Court Professionals, Judge Susan Dobrik. Good morning. On behalf of Michigan Association of Treatment Court Professionals, it's my honor to be a part of this event. As president of MADCAP, I'm proud of the leadership that the trial court judges have shown as a volunteer to lead Michigan's treatment courts. Michigan now has 164 drug, mental health, sobriety, and veterans courts. Our treatment courts reach 97% of the population in Michigan. And as you will hear today, we can show that treatment courts work, that they are assessed by university researchers, and have reduced recidivism among the participants in the treatment courts. Treatment courts are saving lives, and they are helping and strengthening families. For those of you who have a limited background on treatment courts, a treatment court is a court where the target population has a diagnosable emotional behavioral disorder, and that disorder is a substantial factor in why that person is involved in the justice system. And the target population requires professional treatment, and that target population would best progress in treatment regularly monitored by a judge. As a result of MADCAP's leadership with problem-solving courts, we can say treatment works. Our goal is to ensure that individuals receive proper treatment, that the community is protected, and that we're helping families work together as a family unit. In reviewing the data and measuring outcomes, as the Chief Justice has indicated, we can show two years after admission of any treatment court graduate, that graduates were 56% less likely to be convicted of a new offense, that 50% of the participants improved their employment, 98% of the mental health graduates improved their mental health, and Michigan leads this country in the number of veteran courts with 22 veteran courts. For a detailed analysis, please go to the Michigan Supreme Court website for a complete state evaluation on all the treatment courts in Michigan. Today we are pleased to be able to tell you about the success of our DWI courts and show through the data collected that our DWI courts are cost effective, they provide for public safety and the well-being of our communities across Michigan, and they assure better outcomes than traditional court. As a result, we are here to present the evidence to you. It is my honor and my privilege to be able to introduce Judge Harvey Hoffman. Judge Hoffman is the chair of the Legislative Committee for the Michigan Treatment Court Professionals and one of the founding fathers of treatment court movement in the state of Michigan. Judge Hoffman. Thank you. In uh, 2010, uh, the uh, Michigan Association of Treatment Court Professionals, uh, in cooperation with our friends at the Secretary of State, with the folks from PAM, uh, Madam Michigan, and others, along with our legislative sponsors. It was great to see them. It's like the old gangs back together. Um, secured passage of the Michigan DWI Sobriety Ignition Interlock uh, Program statute. And this law uh, allows repeat drunk drivers uh, to have broad restricted driver's licenses 
if they are in either a DWI court, veterans court, or hybrid DWI drug court program and have ignition interlocks uh, on their vehicles. Uh, for the members of the press, if you aren't familiar with ignition interlocks, uh, there's going to be an ignition interlock in a car outside of the uh, Supreme Court building here today, so you can take a look at one and see how it actually, actually works. Now, one of the things in the statute uh, uh, is a requirement that the Michigan Association of Treatment Corps Professionals provide re uh, research on whether or not this program is actually working. And I uh, would be remiss if I didn't recognize the auto owners insurance people for leading the charge as far as uh, getting the monies put together, as well as the Office of Highway Safety Planning, Mike, uh, who also was very generous uh, in their uh, support. Now, in the first uh, three years of the uh, project, we were able to show that while people were on probation and in these DWI court ignition interlock programs, that we were able to see that we could get the licenses, or excuse me, get the interlocks on the vehicles, and that also that recidivism numbers, both in terms of new drunk driving arrests and all other offenses, were much better while we had people on probation. This year, we're very happy to report out the year four numbers, and, and why the year four numbers are significant is most of these probationary programs are for two years. So we now have a very large number of participants who have been out of their probationary programs for a significant period of time, up to two years, so we can see how these people are doing when they're actually off probation. We have some charts here uh, to go through some of the basic numbers. First of all, uh, the first chart here shows compliance with interlock orders, which means do they put the interlocks on the car? And over the four year period of time, the, uh, the DWI for ignition interlocks that we ordered these interlocks on, 97.1% of the people ordered put them on. And that's a significant number because in most ignition interlock programs around the country, 40% or less of people comply with the requirement to put the interlocks on. The second uh, chart we're dealing with today deals with graduation rates, which is, do they complete their programs? Excuse me, can I? Yeah. Sorry. You stepped away from the lectern when oh, Ms. Corbin got up to one of these hot spots. Oh, all right. Well, I, from my old days as a trial lawyer, I assumed that my voice could fill most rooms. But anyway. <laughs> but, uh, my, all right. Um, the, uh, the second thing we're going to talk about today uh, deals with graduation rates. Alcoholics typically spend several years of hard drinking before they finally wind up in a treatment program. And so the most research shows that if you're going to address the underlying addictions of these offenders, you need at least one year of concentrated treatment to be able to address those underlying addictions. People who go into their programs voluntarily have uh, more than uh, or less than 10% of the people actually finish their treatment. That's because usually when the crisis that brought them into treatment, the threats from their boss, threats from their wife, when the crisis goes away, they tend to fall out of treatment. In Michigan, our DWI uh, sobriety courts, uh, prior to the advent of the ignition interlock program, uh, had a 66% program completion rate. Quite good when compared to what happens to people when they go in voluntarily. Since we've had uh, the, uh, the research project the four years with the people in the interlock programs, 88% of the people in the DWI court ignition interlock programs successfully complete their programs. That's a very significant number. And we feel that there's probably two reasons for that. First of all, with the broad licenses that come from the Secretary of State, these people can, can drive to court, they can drive to work, they can drive to school, they can drive to treatment, they can drive to AA, they can drive to testing. So it's actually a lot easier for these people to complete their programs when, rather than the old days, they didn't have any uh, way of driving. Uh, also, we found that these licenses greatly motivate these people. These people know that if they don't succeed in this program, it's, it's going to be a very long time before they ever see any kind of driving privileges. So we find that they're motivated, and that's why we're so, they're so successful in terms of completing their programs. The last uh, one we're going to look at today deals with recidivism. Again, we look at two things, whether or not they get new drunk driving offenses, and then whether or not they pick up other uh, offenses of any kind, shoplifting, speeding, assault and battery, anything other than drunk driving. We have two groups that we're, we're looking at here over the four years. There's the DWI court ignition interlock group. Those are the ones on the left. People who are traditional probationers, they are the ones who are on the right. We're seeing, and we have them broken down by 
the, the two-year, three-year, and then the four-year numbers. In the two-year numbers for new drunk driving offenses, we saw 1% uh, for the ignition interlock DDI court group. People who are on traditional probation, same, uh, same types of people, repeat drunk drivers, demographically the same, 2.9% in that first group. In the third year group, again, around 1% new drunk driving convictions for the people who are in the ignition lock program, the DDI courts, 4.3% for people who are in the traditional program. And what we consider to be the big number, those are the green bars, those are the people for the period of time that they are off probation for up to two years. For the people in the ignition interlock group, uh, DWI court, 2.8% new drunk driving uh, cases compared to 5.5% for the people who are on traditional probation, almost half. That's a very significant number. Then looking at the people who are any other offenses, again, same type of pattern for the people in the interlock group, first year 1.6 compared to 5.3, in the, uh, the third year 3% compared to 95 for people who are on uh, tr uh, traditional probation, and then p uh, the last group for people who are, who are no longer on probation, 8.3 to 11.6. Very nice pattern uh, on, on all the different uh, measurements. The DWI ignition interlock group did significantly better than people on standard probation. And uh, the, uh, there are copies of the slides in your press packets. There's also copies of the full 72 page study. If you have problems sleeping one of the, uh, any night in the near future, <laughs> give it a read and uh, hopefully we can help with that as well. Uh, and uh, now we're going to, uh, Judge Salamone is going to talk about the regional DWI court program. Thank you. I think, I think we're good. Good morning, everyone. Um, so you heard about the success of the ignition interlock, and I have a sobriety court in, in the 23rd district down in Taylor. We had, once the legislation was passed, about six months in, people within the criminal justice system are sensing through anecdotal evidence and from talking to people within the program all the things that the study uh, that the evidence now shows really happened. And uh, thus, people in the criminal justice system began asking the question, how do we expand sobriety courts? There was a related issue of fairness also. You, how come a person arrested in the city of Taylor uh, and entering the sobriety court program would, could qualify for an ignition interlock but a person arrested only three miles from the courthouse in another jurisdiction would not. The easy answer to this, the easy solution would have been we create a sobriety court in every jurisdiction. Um, as you're all aware, the state has neither the money nor the personnel to be able to do, do that. In addition, you don't necessarily need a sobriety court in every jurisdiction. So instead of an easy yet expensive solution, uh, we came up with what we think is the much better solution, regional sobriety courts, regional DWI courts. A regional court occurs when several courts agree that one of the courts will have a sobriety court program, and each of the judges will send eligible participants from their court to the judge with the sobriety court program. So in my case, in Wayne County, in the 23rd District Court, I normally only have jurisdictions over cases that arise in the city of Taylor. Because of the regionalization, I now am able to handle cases that judges send me from the 24th, 25th, and 28th District Courts that includes, up to, that includes seven cities. The budget for our program is $241,000. If each of those participating courts had their own separate sobriety court program, you would probably see costs to the taxpayers exceeding over $600,000. So regional courts are government acting, we think, at its best. It's not just the courts acting together, but you heard from the Chief Justice uh, in, in the names of the participants that are here, the working group with the Secretary of State, how we work with the Supreme Court Administrative Office, the Senate, the federal government provide us funding. You have the prosecutors, the chiefs, all supporting our program. We all work together, efficient use of taxpayers' dollars, and just as importantly, we expand the ability of participants in the criminal justice system to address the problems that underlie their criminal behavior. One of those participants is here today. His name is Matt Raja, and he is a graduate of, of our program. Uh, he entered our sobriety court after being arrested for a third drunk driving in 2012. He readily admitted that his use of alcohol was causing some family problems, some financial problems, and obviously some criminal behavior. Uh, we are very proud to have him here three years later, and uh, I think after you hear from him, you'll understand why. I'm going to let him tell his story. Mr. Wayne. Matt, come on up, please. Thanks, Matt. Good morning. 
My name is Matt, and uh, I'm honored to speak here today. I am a graduate, of, like uh, Judge Sol Solomone said, uh, of his sobriety court there. I'd like to express how grateful I am that the option of being accepted into the sobriety court was there for me. Uh, due to the fact that it was an essential part of my recovery, along with the sobriety court restricted license. Without them, I don't know if I could have achieved any quality long-term sobriety, even with my desire to quit drinking. And I say this because I, I've had many attempts to quit drinking over the past 20 years that went unsuccessful. The ignition interlock was an essential tool to, in my recovery. What it did is help take away the countless hours I was spending on trying to arrange transportation. And, uh, you know, I needed transportation, uh, you know, to, to make uh, all sorts of meetings and, and, and everything there. To be able to spend that time then, I, I was using that time to focus on my sobriety. I believe that if I did not have an ignition interlock while I was a member of the sobriety court, I would have missed a meeting, a drug test, probation appointment, or a treatment session, and would have eventually been serving my remaining time in jail. Due to the numerous demands of being in a sobriety court, but instead what I was doing is relieving the burden of my family and friends who were driving me every day. I was able to keep my commitments to my employer as well as the court. I'd also like to say if anyone is skeptical about the technology of the ignition interlock, that I was impressed that not only would it read a blood alcohol level every three to five minutes while I was driving, but it would also transmit my location through satellite GPS and also take a picture every time I blew into the unit. So that any time your probation officer or the interlock company can review the data in real time to, ins to ensure that you stay in compliance with the sobriety court restricted license. In closing, I'd just like to state that I hope sobriety courts and the use of ignition interlocks remain an option in the future for those who do have the desire to remain sober due to the success I had. I was granted my full license back by the state of Michigan over six months ago, and on June 2nd, I'll have three years sober. Thanks for letting me talk. Have a great day. Well, uh, that's just uh, one example of the many uh, that are being replicated over across the state. We are saving lives, we're saving money, uh, and everybody is winning by these programs. Uh, that concludes the formal portion of our program. If you'd actually like to look at a vehicle equipped with one of these uh, interlock systems, we have one right outside so that you can take a look at it. The uh, local uh, programs will continue on their own. Thank you very much for coming.